All right, welcome. It's good to see everybody here. Glad you're back. Thank you. I am glad to be back. Are you really? What, what's weather like over there? Uh, cold. 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 We didn't have snow, but it was cold. Uh, it was uh, quite cold. Um, and chilly and cloudy and rainy and it it's was. Like here. <laughs> yeah, but just about 30 degrees colder. Both day and night, but uh, anyway, it was great. I'm glad to be back. Uh, so we're back in session. Glad that uh, you didn't forget about us here, and everybody came back uh, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and so we will continue on. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about my trip to Ukraine, and then we'll jump on in, um, and uh, we'll try to uh, work with Ken and try to figure out the mechanics of the, uh, the electronics here and why uh, that's not functioning the way it is so we can see the, the slideshow of that. We've got some neat pictures for that. It was a fascinating experience. Uh, let me say thank you all for your prayers and your support. Uh, I definitely felt them. Uh, it was a long flight. Uh, I left whenever it was, the 19th. <laughs> On my birthday. Uh, and I flew, left uh, San Antonio at noon on the 19th, got there in the afternoon of the 20th, uh, probably about 22 hours uh, in, uh, in the plane total, or the planes. Uh, it was definitely a trip of planes, trains, and automobiles, uh, <laughs> quite literally, because uh, we were in the capital of Kiev uh, for a couple of days, then took a train uh, down to uh, Nipopetrovsk. And yes, I had to practice that one for several days till I could learn to say that one. <laughs> And we're there for a regional briefing. That's a regional city in the southeast uh, portion. Uh, but not so far southeast is where the fighting is, has been and is. Um, but it's a big, important industrial area. In fact, it's where they, uh, they made a lot of the rockets uh, in the former Soviet Union and still have some semblance of the, uh, their uh, space industry there in Nipopetrovsk. Uh, we were deployed then, myself and uh, several teams, to uh, Nipo-Zerzinsk. Also had to practice that one for a while. Uh, uh, which was a, an outlying area, on the, uh, both on the Dnieper River, uh, thus the names, uh, uh, Dnieper in common. Uh, and uh, just beautiful area. The fall foliage was at its height. Uh, the trees were golden and red and just gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, it, I would imagine it would be like a huge Wisconsin because uh, it was rolling farmland, beautiful, rich, fertile, rolling farmland everywhere. Uh, and, but it just goes on and on and on. It's a very large country. Um, and so it was, uh, it was neat to be able to see it, especially by train uh, going through. Uh, then uh, we were in Dniprozhezhinsk region for, a little, for uh, several days. That's where I did the monitoring of the elections. Uh, there were 600 people, um, an international group that was brought in uh, by the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the group that I used to work with, uh, seconded by the U.S. State Department back in Kosovo for 10 years that I told you a little about in the first session for those who were here on day one of our uh, Bible study course. And uh, so they, this is one of the main things they do. They do it very well. So they, the logistics were just incredible. Uh, of how they pulled all this together. Um, uh, and they put you together in teams of, of two uh, internationals from different countries. I had uh, a partner from Denmark who was a former Danish parliamentarian uh, who had been to uh, Ukraine uh, more than 110 times, she said. Um, so she's uh, retired now but still works closely with the Council of Europe and um, is um, very, very uh, well connected and knows uh, the situation there extremely, extremely well. Uh, so in fact, she had a meeting with one of the parliamentary leaders uh, there in uh, Kiev uh, on the day we were leaving, uh, Yulia uh, Timoshenko. Uh, so uh, we had uh, wonderful uh, uh, local uh, staff that helped us. So we were a team of four, uh, Lily, our translator, and Sasha, our driver. Um, and one of the things I learned was uh, a lot of people uh, are named Alexander or, or Alexandra, but both of them are named Sasha. So there's lots of Sashas. <laughs> I ran into lots and lots of Sashas. 
uh, including uh, a, a man who is uh, associated with uh, the Baptist Union, is, is how they term it there. So there's an association of Baptist churches all throughout Ukraine. And they have to register with the government under an umbrella organization. So it's the Baptist Union of Ukraine, I think, if I had the name right. So this man was uh, uh, the coordinator for the music uh, and is very familiar with the, the Texas men's singers, of which Gary used to be a part of, uh, who have been to Ukraine a number of times. So they're, they're well known and very well received there. Uh, so he was real excited that I came from uh, Texas. We, we were introduced through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, a uh, long, long chain of events there, uh, but we uh, got to meet he and his wife um, and uh, were able to deliver some of the humanitarian supplies that different people had uh, donated for that. They have been, bless our hearts, they've got 11 in their house, um, the, the two parents and nine kids. Uh, and they had uh, a two, two different groups uh, just until about a week before I got there uh, that comprised of another 11. So they had 22, uh, including three wives slash mamas sharing one kitchen. So he said, brother, I wasn't anywhere close to that kitchen. <laughs> smart man, smart man. But bless their hearts, because so many people have fled from the east, uh, almost 2 million internally displaced persons uh, because of the fighting and because of the destruction. Uh, now things have calmed down considerably. Uh, I didn't feel any effects of that, didn't see any effects of that myself other than a few military helicopters um, at the airport. Uh, but other than that, it was, it was, you never know that anything was going on. And we were even more towards the east where that was in, in the general direction, uh, not in the west where they've never had any uh, of the recent events. And yet you would just never even know that that was going on. Um, so uh, there's a, an incredible fortitude uh, with the people there. Uh, but uh, it was a fascinating experience to be able to, uh, to go and to visit uh, this part of the world uh, to see uh, what they're having to go through and to be able to meet some fellow believers and see how they're helping the people who have been displaced because, I mean, over almost two million people, that's a lot of people who are staying with friends or relatives or maybe somebody they just met like Sasha and his wife, Ira. Um, and so they've had a, a series of people who have come through and then just opened up their home. Uh, and these are not wealthy people. I mean, they're just living basically on, you know, what, uh, what they can. Um, and there's not a lot of uh, high salaries for those in ministry, full-time ministry over there. Uh, so we... Uh, I felt very honored to be able to meet him and his wife and uh, to uh, spend some time with them. Uh, but that was, that was kind of a highlight, but the, the main purpose, of course, was the elections, uh, which went along great, uh, and which was a huge thing for Ukraine. Uh, so the, they've had a series of elections since they declared independence, and it's been a back and forth, up and down uh, set of experiences. Uh, more recently, since the last uh, Maidan um, uh, outpouring, uh, protest, uh, if you will, a uh, big uprising, uh, which happened several years ago, um, they've had a presidential election, parliamentary election, and this was the first time in, in quite some time they've had local elections. This was key because uh, this was going to help at the very grassroots level for people to, to have an indication of whether they actually felt uh, that they had some voice and were interested in trying to take part in democracy. Uh, they've had a very rough time of it uh, and having Russia next door and instigating all that has been done in the last almost two years now uh, has certainly not helped with a former communist country, fledgling democracy, uh, enduring challenges of uh, oligarchs, corruption, all sorts of different things. Um, the infrastructure was horrible. Uh, you wouldn't believe the roads that we were driving on to these little small towns to go to these polling centers. Uh, and Sasha, bless his heart, had, we had uh, hired him and his car. <laughs> I'm not sure his car will ever be the same because <laughs> he was trying to get us from polling center to polling center as quickly as possible so we could hit as many as we could on election day. And uh, You've never seen potholes like this. It was kada, 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 <laughs> the whole way. So uh, all of us just kind of, uh, we didn't fall asleep in the car, let's put it that way. 
Uh, but uh, he was very good natured about it. And, uh, never, never complained. Always had a smile. Uh, but it was, it was great uh, in that uh, there was no major flaws. I was in uh, Kyrgyzstan in 2009, and uh, just the uh, the process was was um, uh, almost a farce. I mean, you'd see with people with coming with ballots stuffed in their pockets, and they would pull them out of their pockets and stuff them in the box blatantly. And this this happened all over the place. So it was a completely discredited election. Uh, this was an important step for Ukraine on, on two fronts. One, internally, because that helped to build confidence within Ukraine that, yes, we can have elections. We can have viable elections, meaningful elections. Now, there's, yes, there's still some issues, but this was, by and large, very, very good, all things considered. Um, and then externally, internationally, it helped to build the credibility. Uh, Ukraine needs a lot of help uh, from different countries such as ours, and to be able to show that they can have free and fair elections, um, such as they were, uh, goes a long way towards building that credibility, which is vital, vitally important, because they really need the help right now as they're transitioning out of so many difficult situations. I won't spend the hour talking about their history, but uh, but that was that was a uh, uh, an important step for them. So I was very glad to be part of that. Uh, I feel like that's directly related to what we're talking about here as well, because this is democracy in action, democracy being birthed, uh, which is what was so interesting to be for me to be able to spend all that time in Kosovo too, because that was a nation being born, uh, and that's not something you get to see every day. Um, Ukraine's a little farther in the process. They declared an independence in 1991 as the former Soviet Union was crumbling, and yet they're still. Uh, very wobbly on their feet in terms of uh, development. But that doesn't happen overnight. And as we have seen here, talking just very, very briefly in our weeks together about the several hundred years leading up to 1776 and all of that went uh, to that to make that possible, and yet it was still very fragile uh, for decades after that. So it's not an easy process, not a quick process, not a simple process. Uh, and it can go wrong in so many different ways. Uh, so my heart really goes out to countries like Ukraine um, and I want to continue to pray for them and pray for the people of Ukraine as well, that God blesses them um, and so that they don't end up as a train wreck uh, as a nation which hurts, of course, the people is the bottom line. Yes? Are they a religious people? Well, that's a good question, Linda. Um, and one of the things I would have liked to have done is spent more time with the local Ukrainians and just really visited with them, have coffee together and, and find out what's in their hearts. Uh, we had an incredibly uh, hectic schedule because uh, we were flying, moving, driving, on trains uh, almost every day. Um, and so it was just go, go, go. Uh, because they because of our schedule. They do. They do have a constitution that's uh, predominantly Orthodox Christian uh, is their, their religion. Uh, I would say, by and large, my impression was that most people don't actually go to the Orthodox Church very often, you know, when they're born, when they're married, and, you know, a few uh, key holy events of the year or, you know, throughout their lives. Well, was um, their constitution based biblically not, I would think? Um, it's been kind of evolving process, um, and it's been heavily influenced by different political forces that have pushed it one way or another. So it has not been uh, as stable and as fixed, and, mo and that's true of most countries in the world, as ours. Ours has been, been very, very solid. And so that's why the, uh, the cries from some corners of our country today, they're saying, oh, let's scrap the Constitution. It's a dated document. They have no idea how wrong they are. Because seeing different countries that they have a Constitution, uh, and, but then next year they'll have a different one. And then the year after that they'll have a different one depending on what the flavor of the day is or whoever's in power. Uh, so, and that just, you know, you've got to have a steady course, otherwise they're going to be all over the place. Well, since um, Putin is uh, trying to strengthen his muscles, so to speak, has he given them any grief <clears throat> in the Ukraine as far as trying to take it back over? Uh, you can say that, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and they've they've had the uh, the war there in the eastern uh, provinces uh, for the last two years. So there is still a communist influence there. There is, there is. Uh, technically, they've actually outlawed the communist party, but there are some former former communist 
party members who have rebranded under new names but still promote the same types of socialist policies. And in fact, uh, one of the questions that we asked of our driver as we were going through this beautiful Wisconsin-like farmland uh, was, is this been mostly privatized or is it still state-owned? And they said it's still mostly state-owned. And you have these huge fields and this black, black, rich dirt. Uh, I mean, just beautiful farmland. I grew up in a rural area, so I can appreciate that. <laughs> it's beautiful farmland. Um, and mostly state owned, so it's not being very well utilized. You know, and that was the breadbasket of, of that part of the world and still can be, should be. Um, and their, their resource, natural resources are just incredible. They could be a very, very prosperous country. Uh, but uh, yeah, they still have, are Is having a lot of influence. It's going to be a lengthy privatization process where the state actually sells uh, the different assets, such as the land. Um, the concern about, amongst the people is that it's uh, so corrupted, the process is, that it will just go to the oligarchs who own yeah. most of everything anyway. Um, and so I think there's something like 10 or 12 TV stations, and each one is owned by a different oligarch. And each one <laughs> has a small percentage. So at least they, you know, they kind of divide up the pies better than just one or two. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, that's concentrated. Um, and so. These, what do you call them, oligarchs? Oligarch, yes. Oligarch, are they like kings or something? Well, they're just the people who benefited after the fall of communism uh -huh. and who were very clever and scooped up lots of property and with perhaps very questionable <laughs> methods. Um, and so, yes, and have made tremendous amounts of money. It was the same thing that happened in, in Russia and in many parts of the former Soviet Union. Uh, so those who did have some business savvy, not uh, ethical, but business savvy, reached, you know, jumped in and, and grabbed and you know, paid, would pay, for example, uh, uh, pay somebody off and, and would get title to this big factory, uh, different things like that. So. This wasn't where you were, that you stayed 10 years, was it? No, it's not. It, that was in Kosovo which is part of the former Yugoslavia. Oh. Some similar dynamics, though, on that. Oh, I almost forgot. I, brought... I couldn't, couldn't bring anything back from Ukraine, but at least I did get a little, uh, little surprise for you, just to let you know I was thinking about you. <laughs> this is from right here in HEB. <laughs> yeah, they have HEB. <laughs> let me just leave this with you. You could have told us it was Ukraine. <laughs> 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 I wish I could have. I did think about that. <laughs> Bob, did you have a question? Borscht cookies. Yeah, what, what were your duties? What did you actually do? What did I do? You okay. monitoring the voting, but I don't know what that means. Okay. All right. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, yes, when I wasn't eating borscht, uh, <laughs> I was... <laughs> Which is very, very good, by the way. It always sounded terrible, just cabbage soup, but it was delicious. It, it's got some meat in it. It's rich. In fact, there's when we do get to see the movie, there is a uh, uh, there's a picture of it. I, it looks it was so good that I took a picture of it. Uh, so that was that was one of their uh, uh, national dishes, is borscht, um, and uh, so you know there's kind of a rich tomato base, and it's got cabbage and meat. Or can have meat, cannot. But the ones I did, I would add a little sour cream in the top. Rich flavor, just, it was delicious. I was surprised. Uh, it really was. It was very good. Um, they have a, uh, a dumpling. There's two different versions. You get the big one is Vereniki, and the small one is Pilmeni. Uh, my uh, language assistant, Lily, will be very proud of me for mem remembering those. Um, uh, and you can get uh, meat in there, mushrooms, um, carrots, different things. Uh, so that, that's a big thing in that part of the world. There's a version of that in Georgia that I had. Uh, previously as well. Uh, did everybody get as many? Because my daughters are going to eat these if you don't, and they don't need this many after Halloween. <laughs> they're going to hallelujah harvest here. They came home with these big bags full of candy, so we've been having to ration them out. Uh, but back to your question, Bob. I did not forget. My duties over there were to uh, observe the opening of polling stations the voting process throughout the day in as many polling stations as we could go to, and then the counting procedure at a polling station. So by the end of the day, after we had hit 10 or so, uh, driving around on these pothole roads, and eventually um, they, they, the polling was from 
8 to 8, 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening. So we hit the last one by 7.45, right on target, um, and then stayed there for the night. Uh, so, because they closed at 8, so they, they closed down, then they started the, there's a very elaborate counting procedure. Um, and they, I would say, did very, very good. So we were sitting there with a form book, and we're just ticking boxes and asking questions of the polling center chair. Um, and um, I don't know if that's, that's the case here, but um, over there, one, one of the interesting things that I, that I saw, uh, it wasn't this, to this extent in Kyrgyzstan or Kosovo, was 95% um, plus of the people that worked in the polling stations were women were women. Were enough for the women, they wouldn't have elections in Ukraine. And they were the unsung heroes, I have to say. Um, and I think the, the same groups had pretty much uh, were doing this each time, so they were obviously very experienced. So we were very impressed by the polling, people who worked in the polling centers. Um, and we're, there are problems, it, I don't think by and large it lies there. Um, and so they were very dedicated, worked very hard. They get paid a little bit, but not very much. Um, and so uh, just, just as an aside on that, but so we would, I'll come to your question in just a second, uh, but we would then watch the whole counting procedure. They would count the uh, spoiled ballots, the unfulfilled ballots, um, the counted ballots, the uh, uh, different aspects of that, so two or three different ways. And we had uh, mayoral elections, we had city council, we had uh, kind of a regional or county government council uh, that we were going through. Um, and then, so anyway, there's several layers of, of sizes of governments, um, and that some equate to ours, some don't. Uh, so there was multiple races that they were having to count. We finished um, about seven o'clock the next morning. So, so <laughs> seven the next morning, uh, and then we were to. <laughs> so we were right up about 26 hours. And then we got about three hours street, uh, sleep, and then we would go back to the tabulation center. So there was a, a, a center that would collect about 10 or 12 of the polling center's ballots. Uh, they would just bring them in the big bags with the summary sheets, and then they would cross-check everything. And if there were any problems, then they would send it back for a recount. Uh, so then the second phase would go to the tabulation center, uh, who basically checked the homework of the polling centers. Uh, and all this that. was done in one day? Uh, basically two days, two and a half. The voting, was the voting was in one day, yes. One day. Yeah, one day. Wow. Eight to eight on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Sunday the 25th. Wow. Mm -hmm. This is all hand counting? Oh, yeah. No calculators or anything like that? They had a little handheld okay, just for, uh, calculator <laughs> just to double check on that. But, yeah, it was very much of a, a manual process. Uh, and they, uh, they had one... I think 1990 IBM computer that was spitting out some forms, their summary forms. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the printer was even older than that. So. <laughs> it, it sounded like it <laughs> all night long. I was surprised that thing just was still alive. It, it worked hard. Uh, so, anyway. I was just curious about the communication. Do you, you speak Ukrainian? They speak English? Or combination? Or what? Well, uh, for, it was a, the mission itself, the election monitoring mission was an English speaking mission, uh, officially. Um, that's not what they speak in Ukraine, it's predominantly Ukrainian, uh, and the second language is Russian. Uh, now I've learned some Russian, and so I was able to speak a little bit, uh, but I'm still in the early stages of learning that. Um, but I can at least say Dnipropetrovsk. <laughs> so I can say where I was, um, and Borscht. Uh, but uh, each, each team had uh, a language assistant who was assigned to them to help us transact all that we needed to do. And we had lots of questions that we had to ask uh, of the, uh, the polling center managers. So we, we couldn't have gotten by without them. Uh, but I, I have to say that the people were very, very nice there. Uh, and they're very patient with us and allowed us to ask all these questions even in the midst of very hectic times and when everybody was short of sleep. Uh, so I was uh, very positively uh, impacted by just how uh, kind-hearted everybody was. That good coffee no. over there? Eh, not so good. Not so good. <laughs> it, it was okay. It was just What's okay. That? The coffee. Oh. The coffee was okay. Yeah. What, it was, kind of, what kind of car were you in? 
Vehicle. Oh, what are we in? What kind of vehicle? Um, it was a Russian. it was a Lexus, Lexus. Um, uh, SUV GLXTY. I don't know what I don't know what the model number. I can't keep the Lexus number straight, but uh, it was the. It was very nice. <laughs> it was very nice. Now, who did it belong to? Uh, it belonged to our driver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't ask. I didn't ask him how he got it. <laughs> he showed up with it. We said, "All right, <laughs> that works for us." <laughs> that was that was great. <laughs> Some questions you just don't ask, <laughs> but we were very comfortable then that. So that was good. Uh, anything else before we move on? Well, thank you for letting me tell you my my stories on that. It was a wonderful experience. Um, and just all of this in 10 days, and so my head is still spinning a little bit. Um, and so I wasn't able to really <laughs> start putting my notes together until uh, this morning. Um, so um, hopefully tonight will make sense uh, for our study. Uh, but I was, I was very interested and very excited to come back. I uh, missed you all very much. Missed our, our class and our time together. Uh, really enjoying this very much. Um, and so... I uh, was eager to get back and uh, pick up where we left off. I was just looking at the calendar, and I think that we're on, on track even with these two weeks that we uh, took a small break in order to be able to finish up before Christmas. So, And that includes, of course, the Thanksgiving um, week off, because uh, I don't think there will be any Bible studies that week. Uh, so we'll see if we need to go a couple weeks into December. Uh, but I think we're in good shape, and we'll be able to... To book in this thing, uh, frontwards and backwards, and so, and then we'll we'll see what's next after that. So with that, uh, let me just go ahead and uh, open us with a word of prayer before we jump into our study. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and we thank you for being with here, being with us here, and bringing us all uh, back together, and allowing us to continue this study of you and your word, Lord, and helping us to understand what our role is as citizens of your kingdom and citizens of, of this country. Lord, we, we do love you, and uh, we uh, rejoice to see your believers around the world, and the people who love you and follow you, Lord, and are reading your word every day, and Loving you with all their hearts, Lord, and loving their neighbors as themselves, their selves. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you are watching over all of us and that you are blessing us, Lord. And we pray for your guidance as we continue to uh, study your word and to understand our role here. Uh, and that you would uh, help us to understand what, uh, how we should move forward uh, during this time, during this season that you have called us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I have handouts. If you don't mind passing those around, please. And the, the first day, we had declarations. Uh, if anybody didn't get a declaration, we've printed up some more declarations. We're actually getting to the declaration today at long last. You probably thought we'd never get there. But we did, which is one of the reasons I knew I had to come back and I couldn't stay in Ukraine. Couldn't have a Bible study entitled Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness without actually getting to the Declaration itself. Anyone else? I've got plenty of copies, so... I'll tell JD you took two. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, JD, you had just enough. I will. What's that? <laughs> oh, somebody's bicycle horn. All right, with that, let us begin. At long last, to the Declaration. 
So thank you for your patience as we've been going through our foundational materials. Uh, I believe that's uh, vital as we're, we're building this study, building our house, if you will. And each of these pieces are very relevant to the whole. And so I'd like to take this opportunity just to very, very briefly summarize a few of the key principles, biblical principles that we've covered since day one. In the beginning was God. So that's our first key principle. God exists and He created all. He is sovereign, He is eternal, He is the Alpha and the Omega. So that's our, our first and most important principle. Secondly, we are all created. We are not evolved. We are humans made in God's image. We are not trees, we are not monkeys, we are not giraffes. And we are to love God who created us with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls, and all of our strength. God issued that as a commandment to us and gave us a choice, just as He gave Adam and Eve a choice in the garden whether to obey Him. Next, we are to know God's Word. God commanded us to know His Word, have it ingrained in our hearts so that we can live by it, have it near the inside of us so that we live by it according to His Word. Next, God is the ultimate authority in our lives. And as God, as the sovereign King of the universe, we are accountable first and foremost to Him. All of this, we know, all of this is what makes what we call self-government possible. Were it not for this, self-government doesn't function very well. It's just a, would be depending on whatever somebody feels like from day to day. And we all know that some days we feel like it and some days we don't feel like it. And so if our system is based on the principle of self-government, then that only comes from everything that we've just covered. So that's why it was vitally important, even though I know we're all... Uh, seasoned Christians who have been walking with the Lord for years, but to have this all straight in our heads, uh, that's what makes self-government possible. Moving on, as we discussed as well, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are not to live in isolation. The lone wolf model is not a biblical model. We are to be interdependent. We are supposed to help each other and love each other and help each other. And our lives are richer for it. And that's another way that we honor God. Furthermore, we are to teach this to our children. And our children's children. And we spent quite some time talking about that. And how if we didn't, that things went off course. So that was another key principle that we've covered. All of this, therefore, then leads to the philosophy or model of governing, first of all, self. It leads to governance of the family, of the community, governance of the church, and then ultimately is of the nation. All of that is dependent on everything that we've just discussed, just summarized. That go governance of the individual, the family, the community, the church, the nation, all rests on these things we've just talked about. And when it does properly rest on them, then it can function properly. And therefore, we can have what many are clamoring for today, which is limited government. Limited government by the state government. Because the majority of governance, human governance, has already been taken care of by everything we just talked about. If all those things are in line, then there's not much room that we need additional governance. That's why we call for limited government. That's why we only have specific enumerated powers to federal governments and state governments. Because we've got a lot of it already covered. And it's only when we're dealing with larger groups of people that we need to institute 
governments. And we'll talk about that. And some of that language is, is directly out of the Declaration. And we'll get to that in a, in a few weeks. So I wanted to just kind of recap and summarize where we are right now. So with, with this level of foundation that we have built, uh, I'd like to move on to the Declaration itself because it contains little nuggets of a lot of these things. And if you don't have these things straight, you might miss them as we read through the Declaration. And for the benefit of our recorded audience, I will read this out. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, we won't read the whole thing, but it starts this way. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So before we go to the next paragraph, which a lot of this course is keyed on, I want to just pause here for a few minutes and pick out a couple of things. The first question I would have then is, why write this declaration? You've got a copy of it there. It's 1,333 words, not counting the signatures. And so it's fairly lengthy for a Declaration of Independence. I mean, I was just thinking about this. If you're writing a resignation letter to your work, are you going to write a 1,333-page document spelling all of these things out or just say, I quit. <laughs> I'm out of here. So why do this? Yes, Bob would, <laughs> but most wouldn't. <laughs> that is Bob Lupitas, Fredericksburg, Texas. <laughs> what they were doing would have been considered by Great Britain as illegal. Yes. They were trying to build the basis to say, we answer to a higher calling than the King of England. We answer to God himself. And God has imbued us with these inalienable rights, these responsibilities. And so... They're, they're taking this to a higher plane to justify why they're doing what they're doing. Outstanding. <laughs> he did. You get an A, you get an a plus. <laughs> well done, Jim. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, you, you summarized it perfectly, and that's exactly why. Um, part of the answer to this is actually in this first paragraph, which is a, in the last phrase, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So they felt the obligation to explain to the world at large why they were doing this. They didn't have to do that. They could have just sent a, a note to King George and said, bye, sayonara, adios, das vidanya. And that, was, that would have been it. A cannon shot probably would have done the, the same, <laughs> had the same effect <laughs> from Bunker, Bunker Hill or wherever. But instead, they felt the necessity to, as you say, make their case, to appeal to a higher authority. Uh, and they felt the responsibility to explain that, not just to King George, but to a much broader audience. Because this was also going to go to Parliament, who had been repeatedly weakened by King George. Uh, so there was a decent parliamentary system of checks and balances that were in place, not to the extent that we have, but fairly advanced considering, all things considered, uh, for the monarchical systems of Europe of the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, so they wanted it to go to Parliament, but they wanted to go to the English people. They wanted it to go to Europe. They wanted it to go around the world because, you see, they were not just forming a new government. It was a new form of government, and that was the key. And they felt very strongly, and rightly so, that they had been uh, 
blessed by God with the gift of these revelations of pulling these pieces together, connecting the dots and seeing what God's best was. God's best was not for people to be in slavery. He took the children of Israel out of Egypt because they were subjected to 430 years of slavery. So that is not what God has for us. He gave us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as we discussed at the very beginning of our course. And the founders, through many different influences and many different contributors to what was called the American Experiment, pulled these pieces together for a new form of government. And it really was new. It was revolutionary. So it wasn't just revolting, a type of revolution that was revolting against England, against Great Britain, but it was revolutionary in terms of its form, of what it was. And they felt the obligation to share that with the world. And you know what? It has had a major impact throughout the world. And it's, you were asking earlier, Linda, if Ukraine had a constitution. I've been amazed in talking with different uh, lawyers and judges and prosecutors uh, from around the world in my, my different uh, studies and teachings, um, how many constitutions have been patterned after the United States Constitution. Now, they don't generally tend to leave it alone. They change it <laughs> in, in a lot of, lot of instances. Uh, but it has had an amazing impact, more so than any other constitution in the world, in history. Ours has, because of all this. So they wanted to share that. They felt that obligation. So that's a big, big part of why they wrote the, the Declaration. The other thing that I want to point out here, this is the first instance where they list the laws of nature and of nature's God. So they acknowledge God the creator, the God of nature, God of all the world, in the very first paragraph. So it's clear where their beliefs are, what their stand is from the preamble, from the outset of this document. So we could say that it was a global statement of faith by the founders, unequivocal before they even got to the point of forming a constitution and putting the government together, this was just the opening shot of, okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is kind of what our general beliefs are. And right at the front of those was their belief in God. So where we're going to be keying much of the next several weeks is this next sentence that is packed full of goodies, good nuggets for us. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A phrase that we're very, very familiar with, but I would like to, with your permission, um, unpack it, break it down, and let's see what all is in here because they chose their words for the entire document very, very carefully and debated it because, as Jim said, they had to make their case uh, and their lives were on the line. They were committing treason by doing this. Absolutely, they were. And because they were, and not just treason against anybody, but against the most powerful nation on the, on the earth at that time. And so their... Uh, their position was, was very weak, was very tenuous, uh, just a bunch of disparate colonies uh, on this new land. Relatively speaking, not very many people. Uh, they still had a lot of hostile uh, native tribes to contend with to their west. So they weren't in the strongest positions to be issuing this. So at the very least, they needed to pursue the moral high ground to be able to justify this act of treason, this act of sedition, this revolutionary thought. So let's break it down. First of all, we hold these truths. And I'd like to stop right there. 
We hold these truths. You see, the founders had no problem believing that there is such a thing as truth. For some reason, our generation today seems to be a little confused by this. And some people feel like, there's really no such thing as truth. It's all subjective, depending on what you feel, what you believe, what your personal philosophy is. And we've been hearing that for the last several decades. What is truth anyway? Can anybody really say that? Well, the founders could. They had no problem with that as well. And so they started the meat of this with, we hold these truths. So everything after that was truth to them. And again, their lives were on the line, so they needed to be pretty sure about what they believed was true. We need to remember what Jesus said about truth. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The founders knew this. That's why they based their Declaration of their Independence potentially signing their death warrants on the truth, on the, found rock, the foundational bedrock of the truth. Because they know Jesus' words, the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Not just somebody who says it with their mouth, but they don't follow it up with their lives. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So when you accept the Lord, when you love the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength, and when we learn His Word and follow His ways, then we will know the truth. And that truth will set us free. And it set this country free. It set a whole new nation free that had been subjected to slavery of a form of a very repressive and increasingly repressive regime by a very capricious leader who kept changing the rules. The folks back in England were having a hard time of it as it was, but they had nowhere to go. But those who were the colonists over here realized they had a choice to make, and they did make it. And they felt that the truth was setting them free, and they felt like that was, that was God's will for them to be able to be free out from under this, this yoke. Another scripture I want to point to, it's not up here, but is John 14, 15 to 17, and verse 21. So if you want to make a note of that. It says, If you love me, Jesus is talking, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. And on to verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So the Spirit of truth is in believers of Jesus Christ. This allows us to be able to see the truth and realize that truth exists and that God is true. And God's truths are real. So if the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, or those two terms are synonymous, are not in somebody, then they can make statements like, well, there's really no such thing as truth. It's just subjective. Whatever you feel, whatever I feel. Who's to say what's right? Who's to say what's wrong? And of course they're going to feel that way because they don't have the spirit of truth the Spirit of the living God living in the side of them to have that discernment, to be able to discern what is true and what is false. That's why we live in a different way, because God has put the Spirit of truth inside of us. And the Spirit of truth was inside the founders, and they were able to see these bedrock foundational truths. That's why they were able to put together our blessed country, because they could understand this, that so many generations had completely missed or maybe they saw parts of it, but they didn't see the whole. John chapter 14, 
verses 15 through 17, and then 21. And it looks like we're going to have to stop there, because we're right at 7 o'clock. Any questions or comments before we do, though? All the more reason that the believers of Christ need to speak out and say what truth is. Because God's put the spirit of truth in us, so we know. Yeah. We know. And we need to, to not be afraid to say it in an increasingly hostile environment to the truth. And so that is part of our responsibility to do that. But you're absolutely right, though. I mean, the, the atmosphere has changed. In all of our lifetimes, it's changed a lot. And we're hearing Very lots much. and lots yeah. of lies. Yes. Lots of lies. Lots of lies, yeah. But we are enabled to know the difference so that we will not be fooled because the spirit of truth is in us. But it scares me when, we think, when I think of, of holding another election next year. <laughs> and with all the the, uh, the untruths that are circulating, and people, some people are believing those. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's just, it's very scary to me. And I don't want, I don't want our country to be a third world country. Right. Nor do I. Right. Nor do I, sister. <laughs> but that's why we've got to be armed uh, with the knowledge of the truth and so that we can speak the truth uh, within our communities all throughout this this nation and so that people can hear truth and not just hear the lies and be confused by that and that is all of our responsibility and as one of the scriptures that we read several weeks ago was my, parish, my people perish for lack of knowledge, that they don't have the knowledge of, of the truth and they don't understand and they, get, they can be very confused by um, just the whole swirl of this and that and this and that, not knowing where the truth is and to be able to be settled in that no matter what all the talking heads might be saying. Yes, I saw that. Well, I was very pleased to be Yes. In, in Houston, yeah. In Kentucky? The new governor of Kentucky? Yes. That's a big triple. Yes, it is. It is. God is in charge, and that's, that's where our, our, our confidence is, and that's where our peace is. If God were not in charge, then we, we'd be lost a long time ago. But God is still on the throne, and we are His children, and God will look out for us, and God will come through even when it seems the darkest. Well, that was a um, very big revelation to me yesterday when He won that, um, that race. Mm -hmm. Yes. All is not lost. That's no. What I thought. All is not lost. Yeah, exactly. Anything else before we... Good for them. Yes. So, all is not lost. <laughs> be, be encouraged, dear sister. Be encouraged. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, then uh, I don't want to hold you too long. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for not uh, 
giving up on the class and keeping on after the break. And uh, think about it as halftime. So now we're in the second half. <laughs> Just started the second quarter. Uh, good things to come. Uh, so I hope that you'll uh, stick with it uh, till the end as it all, all the pieces come together to create a whole. Yes, Bob Lupitas. Yes, I did. And might. Yes. I've got, I've got a lot of great materials on the, on the Constitution. So what I'd like to do is towards the end of the course, just have a group discussion and see if there's interest in that and in doing a, a part two, if you will. Um, and that was actually my original thought was to do that because of a course that I uh, had taken online last spring. But then the more I was looking into it, the more I realized that's actually, at least in my mind, a part two. We've got to have the foundation secure. And I've, I mean, it's been a, a, a journey of discovery for me as well as I'm putting all these things together so that I'm really clear on my foundation. And then from that point, I can go forward, just like the founders did. So to me, that was what made sense. So I had to, um, so this is, this is new. This is a new course, new material. Uh, the Constitution is, uh, all materials are, uh, there's a lot of that. So if there's an interest, yes, be happy to do it. Very happy to do it. Um, all right. Well, actually, would you be so kind as to close us in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for all of our blessings and for bringing us of this day. Thank you for this wonderful course that you have given to us, for this opportunity to learn things that we did not know previously. Dear Lord, we ask you to keep your heads around us and out. We ask you that 